You got your Bibles? Don't go to sleep on me back there. Uh, I want y'all to look at 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. 1 Samuel 16. Y'all don't do this much, so stand up. Uh, I want to just feel like, the, the yeah, everybody in the church. Y'all remember we used to do that in church? Stand up. Amen. Let's stand up. Stand up. Right in the, come on now. Get up off the couch. Get up out the chair. Get up out the bed. Stand up right there with your pajamas on and grab your, your Bible, your iPad. 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 13 says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, you have mourned long enough for Saul. <laughs> Would you look at somebody and tell them you've been sad long enough? I have rejected him as king of Israel, so fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. But Samuel asked, how can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Take a heifer with you. The Lord replied, and say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you which of his sons to anoint for me. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed, and when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong? They asked. Do you come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Tell somebody beside you, purify yourself. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. And when they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. Surely this is the Lord's own. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Somebody ought to say amen right there. Then Jesse told his son Abinadab to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, this ain't the one. Next, Jesse summoned Shemaiah, but, but Samuel said, Neither this, it, this one the Lord has chosen. And in the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, Are, there, are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse replied. But he's out in the fields watching the sheep. He's essential. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. My God, today. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, that's the one. Anoint him. <laughs> oh, my God. Look at somebody beside you say, that's the one. That's the one. That's the one. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. I want to go back to that verse up there where it says this. Uh, he says, verse 7, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge about what he looks like his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to get your heart right. You got to get your heart right. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Watch this. Uh, there's solid evidence that aerobic fitness ups the odds of living longer. If you want to live longer, you got to get your aerobics up. If you want to live longer, you got to exercise uh, at least 30 minutes every day for five days. Just 30 minutes a day, five days a week can keep you fit. The question is, how do you know you're getting enough out of your 30-minute workout? That's where your heart rate comes in. Reaching your target heart rate, which is calculated based on your age, gender, and resting heart rate, allows you to burn off calories without putting yourself at risk of an injury. And raising your heart rate isn't as hard as you might think. You don't have to run. You don't have to sprint. You can just walk, Dwayne. Just walk. I, my, my frat brother, who um, was the star football player at Western Kentucky University, he, 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 he saw me years ago. He lost a lot of weight. He looked good. I said, I said, Noop, what you doing? You lost so much weight. He said, I walk 
he says, I, I just walk like this. <laughs> He, he said, he said, I just walk real fast. He talks like Mike Day. I just walk real fast. And uh, he lost a lot of weight, but he didn't do a lot of strenuous stuff. He just walked. Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? My God, if we're going to stay fit, we got to walk. But not just walk, walk with Christ. We got to walk with a sense of urgency, a sense of purpose. If we get our heart rate up, watch this. They also did a study with children, and they discovered, Shauna, that children who exercise had the ability to have more focus and attention. And what they discovered was is that when you get your heart rate up, it causes oxygen to get to the prefrontal cortex, which causes you to be less compulsive. Y'all not listening to what I'm saying? When you walk and when you exercise, it allows you to have more focus and attention. So your heart has something to do with your mind. If I can get my heart right, I can get my. I, I'm, I'm just trying to help some people today that haven't been able to think clear. You've been fuzzy. You've been making bad decisions, been compulsive. Doing things that you've never done under these situations and this pandemic because you're not exercising. Your heart ain't right. But if I can get my heart right, I can get my mind right. And when, the more I begin to research this thing, this thing on heart, what I discovered is that in the Bible, when the Bible mentions heart, it ain't talking about the organ. It's not talking about this thing that pumps blood and, and makes sure the oxygen gets throughout your body. It's not talking about that. It's talking about the seat of consciousness. It is the, the inner self of every human being. It is, it is the center of decision making. It's the heart. We got to make sure our hearts are right. It's the inner self. It's the essence of life, the, the terms of thinking, the willing, the feeling. The heart is the seat of mental or spiritual powers and capacities. It's the innermost part of man and woman. In our text, we discover that, that because King Saul uh, had a bad heart, he made bad decisions. Listen to me. He is the first king of Israel. Saul is the first king of Israel. And, and, and God anoints him, uh, sends the prophet Samuel to anoint him. And even when he found Saul, Saul was hiding amongst the baggage. He, he was taller than everybody else, but he was hiding Kalia amongst the baggage. And that should have been an indication that something wasn't right because all of us got some baggage. Oh, my God. Isn't it good news that, that God can, can, can use you even when you got baggage and it's not it's not that God is looking for anybody perfect but he's looking for people whose hearts are willing and it turns out that Saul he had the potential he had the potential to be a good king but he made a bad decision that would haunt him the rest of his life here's here's what happened uh Saul was getting ready to fight uh, the Philistine army and, and the prophet Samuel, who had anointed him to be king, told him, wait on me and I'm going to offer a sacrifice so that God's favor can be with you when you go on the battlefield. But because the, the prophet was taking his time and not moving at the timetable in which Saul wanted, he grew antsy. And, and also, watch this, some of his men began to scatter because they were intimidated by the Philistine army. Army. So some of the people started walking out, you know, like in church when you take it too long and people start leaving out the back door or, or like when, when you don't when, when you're not making the kind of money you thought you was going to make it. Some of your friends start leaving. Y y y listen to what I'm saying? When people have you ever been in a time in your life when people started to scatter and, and you started to panic and say, God, where are you? You said you were going to be with me. My money's getting funny. My change is getting strange. My, my bank account is starting to scatter. And if you're not careful, you will start acting outside of your anointing because you're panicking at the people scattering. And what Saul does is that he takes it upon himself to play prophet and priest and make the sacrifice himself. And right at the time where he's preparing the sacrifice, the prophet comes up and says, what are you doing? He said, I, I wanted to make sure that God was with me, so I didn't think you was coming, so I did it myself. He says, you made a stupid decision because I told you I was coming. How many of us have played God? Because we saw the people scattering. 
You saw your bank account going down. You saw your friends leaving. And, and, and sometimes God will put you through a test. So, oh, shut up. Sometimes, watch this, in order to see if your heart is healthy, the doctor will induce stress just to see how good your heart is. Sometimes before God gives you too much, He's going to test you to see where your heart is. And some of the stress that y'all are going through is not the devil. It might be God saying, can you trust me? Even when people scatter. Is anybody listening to what I'm saying? Sometimes God has to put us under stress test. And, and Saul didn't pass. But that was not the first time. There was another time when Saul, God said, it's all right. I'm, I'm still going to be with you. But I'm going to give you a, a redo. But this time he says, when you fight the Amalekites, the Amalekites were enemies of Israel. And when they came into the promised land, they were the only ones that would not allow them to pass through. So the Israelites had to go around. And God says, I'm going to remember that. I'm going to deal with them later. So when they get a king, God says, go back and deal with the Amalekites. And I want you to kill everybody in the village. I want you to wipe everything out. Don't leave nothing alive. And when, and when Saul goes in and conquers the Amalekites, he, he doesn't listen to God. He takes the king captive, and then he takes some sheep, he takes some goats, he takes some lambs, he takes some Gucci, he takes some Prada, he takes some money, puts it in his 401k account. And God comes back, and the prophet comes back and says, <clears throat> what's this bleeding of sheep I hear? Where'd you get that money from? Where'd that come from? Didn't I tell you to destroy everything? And Saul says, but, but, but I, watch this, here's what we do. But, but, but I did it because I wanted to, to sacrifice something for you. And God says, the prophet says, obedience is better than sacrifice. And disobedience is as witchcraft. And a lot of times what we say we're doing for God, we're really doing for ourselves. My Lord, today y'all ain't going to help me preach this thing. He says, what, 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 what were you doing? He said, what's more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, or your obedience? Sometimes, good God Almighty, if we're not careful, if we... If we do ministry the wrong way, the sacrifices we're making don't go up to God. They don't get further than the ceiling of the church because our hearts are not right. If your hearts are not in the right place, if your motives are not correct, God says, I don't know what that funky stuff is you just sent up, but it's not pleasing in my sight. What is this? Oh, my God. Help me in here today, Lord. Somebody's got to understand that I got to get my heart right. Touch your heart and say, I got to get my heart right. We, we know our hearts are out of shape when we start acting out of disobedience, when we are compulsive and make bad decisions. There's no right way to do the wrong thing. Saul started acting out of disobedience by making sacrifices that he was not anointed to make and keeping what he should have destroyed. Can I say that again? He started making decisions he wasn't anointed to make and started keeping stuff he should have killed. What, what are some things that you're holding on to that are stinking up your life? What, what are some decisions you've been making and you know you, you, you're operating out of, your, out of your anointing? You're not in your lane. You, you, you're doing things that you were not created to do. You're not, you're not doing things you're shaped to do. And, 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 and God is not pleased with sacrifices he didn't request. My God today. I, I get it. I get it. It's scary when you're facing insurmountable odds and the people you thought were going to be around to fight with you are leaving and you start wondering, is God ever going to show up? But this is the time when your heart is really put to the test. You got to pass the stress test. When God sends the prophet Samuel to anoint the next king, he's afraid because he knows that Saul's heart is not right. Listen to what I'm saying. The prophet is afraid to go and anoint the next king because God has rejected Saul. And, and the prophet says, I'm not sure I want to go to Bethlehem and try to anoint a new king because the old king going to see that as insurrection and you know his heart ain't right, so he's going to try to kill me. And God says this. He says, I'm, I want you to still go, but I want you to go make a sacrifice. And if anybody asks you why you're there, you tell them you're coming to make a sacrifice. Let me, I'm trying to fix this up so you can understand. So, so sometimes, uh, here's the elephant in the room. Uh, Saul was really never supposed to be king. 
God simply gave the people what they wanted. And sometimes the worst thing God can do is to give you what you want. God had been God over Israel since he brought them out of Egypt and took them to the promised land. And when they got to the promised land, they wanted what everybody else had. And what everybody else had was a king. And what happens to us is that when we, God allows us to be delivered from bondage, you start getting around people and you want what they have when God was everything you needed the whole time. And you pick a king over the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And God says, they're not rejecting you, Samuel. They rejected me. And so, and so God is now trying to fix what the people messed up. Where we are right now as a country is because the people selected a leader that God never wanted. Oh, my God. God didn't ask us to sacrifice universal health care. God didn't ask us to sacrifice immigrant children at the border. God didn't ask us to sacrifice black and brown people in the streets by police brutality. God did not ask us to sacrifice years and years of civil rights by going 50 steps backwards. God is not pleased with this, but God is getting ready to set the record straight in November. But I wonder if the people are going to choose God or choose another bad leader. Uh, y'all, y'all, ain't nobody saying amen on that. They're like, oh, pastor, don't say that. You know, you know he petty. You know he might be watching right now. He might kill you. <laughs> I, I ain't scared. I know who my God is. He said, he said, he said, go make, hey, Vic, come on, man. He said, go make a sacrifice. He, he says, he said, don't be acting like no punk prophet. Go up in there and tell him you're coming to make a sacrifice. Because watch this. The only time people get uncomfortable with the prophet is when they ain't living right. If you make if you make people uncomfortable, it's because of the anointing on your life. I feel like preaching today. If you make people uncomfortable, it's because you got the truth. And when they saw Samuel come into into Bethlehem, they said, "What's wrong? Why something got to be wrong when the preacher show up?" If, I shouldn't. If I'm making you nervous, it's because you ain't living right. I need something. In, my God, today, I feel like preaching today. Do y'all make people nervous? Do you know people act different when you come around? Do you notice people stop talking when you walk in the room? Do you notice how people shut up when you walk in? That's because they not living right. It's not a reflection on you. It's a reflection on... I I, y'all done made me start preaching up in here. I feel, I feel my help coming on. He says, I'm coming to make a sacrifice. And watch this. Here's what Samuel says to the people. He says, purify yourselves and come and join me in the sacrifice. You don't want in and everybody coming to what God's ready to do in your life. If they're not pure, you don't need them around you. Consecrate yourself. For what the level that God's getting ready to take me to, I don't need dirty people around me. For what God's getting ready to do in my life, I don't need toxic thinkers around me. For what God's getting ready to do in my life, I need somebody to consecrate themselves because God's taking us to another level. Number one, you are invited to consecrate and join in the sacrificial meal. Before you can find out your shape, you're invited to consecrate. There's a cleansing of the heart that is necessary before you can find out your shape. When the Holy Spirit invites you into the will of God, there's some consecration, some purification that is necessary. Jesus told his disciples, one of the greatest commandments is to what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, your strength. Watch this. There is an integration that must take place before, I, I, I'm sorry, let me, let me talk to you in the living room. There is an integration that must, must take place in your heart, mind, and soul before God can use you. There are three dimensions to life, heart, mind, soul. Watch this. But there are also three dimensions to your life, public, private, and secret. <laughs> I, I got to break that down. It's your public life, Kalia, is who you want everybody to believe you are on Facebook. <laughs> that, that, that's your public life. <laughs> hey, I'm having a good time. Your private life is you catching hell at home. And, and you arguing with your spouse even though you were smiling on Facebook. <laughs> and then the secret is, is that you got a side chick and that's why you're arguing. 
And until I can integrate my public, my private, and my secret, my heart's jacked up. And the reason God can't use some of y'all is because you're bifurcated and split into so many different personalities that God don't know who he's talking to. You have to fully integrate public, private, and secret until there's no more secrets. Really, it ain't no secret for God anyway because God already sees your heart. The reason you need to integrate it is not for the purposes of God, but for your own self-awareness so that God can move you forward into your destiny. God can't use you until you can love him with all your heart, mind, and soul. Oh, my God. I, I, I'll do better next week. I'm sorry. Number two, stop looking at outward appearances and judging people by what you see. How many of y'all got in trouble? By picking people by what you could see. Mark, you better say something. <laughs> Just because she look good don't mean she good. She can have a body by Mattel, but a mind by Fisher. You have to make sure you know that person's heart. Let me get on my sisters. I need somebody tall, dark, and handsome. But is he crazy? How does he treat his mama? Does he love the Lord? Oh, but he has a six pack. But <laughs> can he pay his bills on time? Is he going to raise your kids? You have to know a person's heart, right? God already knew who he was going to select as the next king, and he didn't even tell the prophet because he wanted to show, the, he wanted to show Samuel that not even you can see what I'm getting ready to do. My God, listen, this is deep. This is deep. Uh, AJ, uh, it took him seven times to anoint the right person, and he was a prophet. Could it be that sometimes God won't even show the prophetic? Because who I'm getting ready to pick, you're going to know that didn't nobody do this but God. In this next move of God, God is going to select people that you would not have picked. Because watch this. <clears throat> Some of y'all have been overlooked because you don't look like the place God's going to take you. I don't, look like a, I don't look like a king right now because I'm working in the hub. But God's getting ready to call me up to the executive level at FedEx while I'm pushing a broom at the hub. Y'all not going to help me in here. And so some of y'all who are anointed right now need to understand that I might not look like, I, like the place where I'm getting ready to go, but it doesn't mean that I'm not anointed. And don't be surprised if some of the people around you don't recognize your heart because they stuck on your appearance. And sometimes God does that not for you to be embarrassed, but to protect you from fake and shallow people people God's not going to release you till it's time for him to use you and sometimes God has to hide you in obscurity by not allowing you to look like where I'm getting ready to take you oh God as a matter of fact most of the people that God wants to pick in this next season are people everybody else passed over because the season they saw you in didn't look like the place he's getting ready to take you the people with the best shape might not even be in the room right now y'all better stop going in trying to look for tall dark and handsome and, 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 and who's shaped and who's got the waist trainer on you better look and see if they've been walking with the Lord you better see if they know how to pray you better look and see if they, if they know Jesus you better see if they got the Holy Ghost you better do some internal in introspection God tells the prophet I have rejected all of these because their hearts are not right this goes to show that you can look the part but if your heart ain't right God is not going to waste his oil on you let me say that again. You can look the part, but if you do not have the oil, if, you do, if your heart's not right, God won't let the prophet waste oil on you. And some of y'all keep wanting 
something that you can't have because God says, I can't put it on you till you get the inside right. You can go and buy the nicest outfit, get your hair done, get your nails did. But if your heart's not right, I can't appoint you to the next season. If I, if I can't get you to integrate your public, private, and secret self, I can't take you to the next level because I can't trust where your heart is right now. And many of us are stuck in places where we're not supposed to still be in, but God can't anoint you because he's not wasting oil on people whose hearts are not right. God told the prophet, don't put no oil on now one of them. I don't care what you think they look like. Men look at the outward appearance, but I'm looking at the heart and I don't see nobody in this room who has the right heart. Do you have any more sons? Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? He says, I got one son, but he's out in the field. Can I, can I, can y'all help me? Can you go with me real quick? If he asked everybody to purify themselves. If they know they're getting ready to make a sacrifice, why is David the only one not in the room? My God today. Because David was essential. And sometimes the people who are most anointed are not the popular people in the room. The people who are most anointed are not the people holding the microphone. God is preparing somebody in the back room of life because he's trying to get their hearts right so that he can make sure that I can use them when I promote them. Can somebody listen to what I'm saying? God, oh my God, for years, y'all, for years, I was in the back room. Kim, you were back there with me. You were in the basement with me at Mississippi Boulevard. And I remember crying one night when I was 31 years old and, 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 and a church called me and said, I'm sorry, we picked another candidate. It was a church in Nashville, Tennessee, and I was holding Jordan in the hospital room, and I began to cry because all of my friends had churches, and I'm still in the back room watching sheep. And I said, I'll never, I guess I'll never pass the church. I guess I'm not good enough. I guess I'm not handsome enough. I guess I'm not smart enough. 11 years I've been a youth pastor, God. This is what you want from me? And God says, I'm not ready to release you yet. I got, I got to work on your heart. My, my heart, God had to pierce my heart. God had to consecrate me. And it was when I was 33, the same age when Jesus was crucified, that I was released to start a church in Hickory Hill. And when God started that work, he didn't just start another church. He started a movement. Y'all not going to hear what I'm saying today. God took a little nappy headed boy from the backside of nowhere and put me in front of a people that I didn't even know existed because God had put me in the backside of nowhere so that when he could promote me, he could trust me because I've been under the stress test. I had been broken. I had been humbled. God had to humble me before he could raise me because of all the stuff that God was going to put me in charge over. He had to make sure he could trust me and my heart was fully integrated. He wasn't going to release me until it's time and God is not going to release you until he can break you, until he can shape you, until he can mold you, until he can fill you with his Holy Spirit. Some Somebody needs to tap your own self and say, I think it's about that time. I think my heart is right. I think my mind is right. I'm ready to start walking with God. I'm ready for God to take me to the next level. I'm ready to consecrate myself. I have been broken enough that you ain't got to break me no more. Is there anybody in here who's been through enough brokenness and enough stress and enough hard work that you know that God, I'm ready for you to use me? Oh God, I thank you today. Thank you, Holy Ghost. If, if, they're, if they're having a sacrifice, why ain't David in there? God was trying to make sure that David was ready. And when he walked in the room, watch this. Oh, my God. Listen to this. I'm trying to rush. I'm, not, I'm trying not to rush. When he walks into the room, before he walks in the room, here's what the prophet says. He says, he says where do you have another? He said, yes, he's out in the field. He says, bring him now. We're not eating until he gets here. Y'all missed this. I, I preach this all my life, but I ain't never seen this. This is good. Uh, this is good. Wake up. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. Wake up. What's the matter with you? Listen, he said this. He said, we're not going to eat <laughs> until he gets here. Can I help y'all? The reason they ain't opened up yet. The reason they not hiring right now is because... They can't open till you get in the room. Oh, my God. Listen, listen. they not shut down because of Corona. 
They shut down because you ain't showed up yet. Can I get some help in here? They, they, they can't release the loan because you ain't walked in the bank yet. They, they can't hire because you ain't put your application in yet. And God says, we're not eating until David shows up. Can I help somebody today? There's something with your name on it, and it can't be released. It can't open up. It can't sell. It can't go until you walk in the room because God has prepared you for this, and we're not eating. Good God Almighty. I need somebody to get this. They can't eat until you show up. They can't move until you show up. They can't hire until you show up because what God has for you, it is for you. And if your name is on it, they can't eat until you sit down at the table. Oh my God. Whoa, I said, Dwayne, are you getting ready to work? Dwayne, go here. Don't you leave me, Dwayne. We're getting ready to go somewhere. Watch this. He, when David walks in the room, Samuel says, That's him. The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost says, that's him. That's the one I've been waiting on. Tony, he, he, he's ruddy. He's still dirty. He's got dirt underneath his fingernails. His hair is nappy. He hadn't had time to go to the barbershop because Corona. He, he, he's been out in the field working. He's, he's smelling like sheep. He ain't, he ain't got no time for a cologne. He ain't got no tailor-made suit. He looks like sheep. He got sheep dung on his feet. He's been outside all day smelling like outside. But when he walks in the room, the prophet says, that's him. Get the oil ready. And I'm sure the other brothers who had got dressed for the occasion were dapper down and had their sho Gucci shoes on and their Gucci belt. They looking around like, what's wrong with him? Why he getting the all? Because it ain't about what you got on. It's about what you got in. Is there anybody in here who knows that this is my season and I might not have money to get my hair cut. I might not have money to buy a new outfit, but that's not what God is looking for in this season. God is looking for people who got the right kind of heart. Y'all, I got to preach this like I feel it. God is looking for somebody who ain't got all their teeth yet. God is looking for somebody who, whose nails are jacked up. God is looking for somebody who's driving a hoopty and barely has enough money to put in the gas tank. God is looking for somebody who's hungry and ready to work. God is looking for somebody who has a drive. God is looking for somebody who is humble. God is looking for somebody who has the right character. God is looking for somebody who knows how to pray. God is looking for somebody who knows how to persevere. God is looking for somebody who has the ability to keep going in spite of obstacles. God is looking for somebody who knows how to fight lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. He looked at David and said, that's the one. And he got his oil out. And he anointed David. Why did he anoint David? He says, man, Man looks at the outside but God looks at the heart God can you tell me what you saw in David he looked at David and he saw some courage in David he said that boy knows how to fight he's for lions and tigers and bears and so I know that he has what it takes to fight Goliath because he knew that in a few more months there'd be a Goliath a giant that was intimidating the whole army and when little David saw it he said who is this uncircumcised Philistine talking all this smack and what will be done for the man that fights and defeats Goliath and they said David the man that defeats Goliath will be tax exempt and marry the king's daughter and his brother Eliab heard David talking he said where did you leave all them little sheep with you just came down here to meadow and David said why are you always hating on me why I watched the sheep while you sat in the house and watched Netflix and chilled I'm not afraid of a giant I use my slingshot is there anybody in here who may not have much but that which I do have I can't lose with the stuff I use he had some courage not only did he have courage but he knew how to worship Brandon he was a worshiper he worshiped in the field he worshiped at home and when it came time to look for a musician Dwayne he said I need somebody who can help the king because King Saul is out of shape and he's got an evil spirit but whenever David played the evil spirit left Saul alone he was a worshiper and God says I need somebody who can praise me and not too cute and not 
too important and not too handsome well you can't mess your weave up and you can't sweat your suit out is there anybody that can worship God this morning I'm a worshiper that's what I do I'm a worshiper I'm not too educated that I can't praise and I'm not so important that I can't lift up my hands do I have any worshipers this morning he had courage he was a worshiper and he had the ability to be a strategist because when David put together a strategy to defeat the Philistines David was so shrewd that he acted crazy so he could escape the Philistines only to come back and to defeat the Philistines God is looking for people who had the ability to strategize and to make plans and to win wars he needs somebody who has a good heart and a good mind and then David oh my God had the ability, watch this, I'm done. He had the ability to acknowledge I'm wrong. My God today, help me. I need, can I take my time right here? He had the ability to say I'm wrong. Watch this. God had rejected Saul. Is this camera working? God had rejected Saul because Saul played God. Saul offered sacrifices he wasn't supposed to make. Saul didn't kill what God told him to kill. And God rejected him. But pastor, wait a minute. I know the Bible. And my Bible says David slept with Bathsheba, who was not his wife, got her pregnant, then set her husband up to be murdered who was simply one of his soldiers trying to fight in a war. Why did God hey, keep David and not Saul? Because the difference between Saul and David is that when Saul got fired, he wanted to keep his image up and beg the prophet, would well, just go back with me and pretend like God is still with me. He didn't repent. He tried to cover up. But when David, when Nathan comes to David and says, you killed that man's, you killed that woman's husband. You are the man. And David says, Lord, forgive me. I have sinned against you and you alone. Renew the right spirit within me. Restore the joy of my salvation. Wash me with hyssop. Make me white as snow. Forgive me of my sins. And then, Lord, I'll teach transgressor your ways. Lord, if you please forgive me, don't, don't take your spirit away from me, Lord. And David fell on his feet and he said, I am the man. I messed up. I'm not perfect. I've sinned and fallen short. Is there anybody in here who knows that I'm not perfect, but I still love the Lord? That's the kind of person God can use somebody whose heart is right enough to know that when I mess up, I can repent. Isn't it good news, AJ, to know that God will never stop loving you no matter what you do? The Bible says in Luke 4, he says, out of a good man's heart come good things, but out of a bad man's heart come corrupt thoughts and actions. And when David recognized that he, was, he had become corrupt, he changed course and he repented. And all God is asking for you today is for you to repent and to get your heart right. God wants to know what, what's driving your heart today. What, 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 what are you passionate about? What wakes you up at night? What, what robs you of your sleep? That could be a clue to what God has built your heart for who is it that God wants you to help who is it that God wants you to use your spiritual gifts to help you, who is it single moms is it young men who've gone to prison and watch this I, don't mind. I, I love the Holy Ghost because he's talking to me right now when David left Saul and ran for his life the Bible says that David went into a cave and all those watch this who were discontent distressed and in debt followed David and he became their leader. Listen to me. Did you hear what I said? All of those who were discontent, distressed, and in debt. There was a particular group of people that David was called to because of the shape of his heart. 
And there's a particular subset of people that you've been called to. I have an affinity for single mothers and for young men who grew up without daddies because that is how my heart was impacted. And so it's no wonder that there's a lot of single moms at my church. There's no wonder there's a lot of hurting young men at my church. There's no wonder that there's a lot of young people because he shaped me in the backside of nowhere in the basement of Mississippi Boulevard for 11 years. Why am I still a youth pastor at 31 years of age? Because God says, I'm getting ready to send you to young people so you can relate to them. Who is it that God has shaped you for? This the stuff that you've been through was not a waste. The pain you experienced was not a waste. God was using that because there's a particular subset of people that God has shaped you for. I want, I want to pray for you today as I get ready to leave today. And I want to pray that God would use your heart. Watch this. I want you, I want you to fully integrate your public self, your private self, and your secret self. There are some things that you've been holding on to that you should have killed. There's some sacrifices you've been making and you were not obedient to what God says. And God says, I want your obedience, not your sacrifice. Good God Almighty. Listen to what I'm saying. I got to break this down. You're sacrificing your children trying to keep a job God didn't tell you to keep. You're sacrificing your, rep your, your friendships because you're pursuing people who are not friends. And you're thinking that if I can get the acceptance of these people, then I can elevate myself. And God said, you sacrifice people who really loved you for people who don't like you. And God says, if you would just be obedient and, 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 and love how I have shaped you and stop trying to please people. See, that's where we get in trouble when we start trying to please people rather than pleasing God. God says, if you would just stop and please me, if you would do what I want you to do, I could walk in the room and anoint you. And watch this. Your gifts are going to bring you into the room of great men and women. Your gifts will make room for you. God says, I'm going to anoint you like never before, but I can't do it until you get your heart right. I'm praying for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm praying for my brothers and my sisters, essential workers and overlooked people and people who are not tall, dark, and handsome, but short and ruddy. People who can't afford to go to the beauty shop or barbershop. People who have experienced folks scattering out of their lives. People who are under stress and wondering, does God still love me? And I'm praying today that, that God, you would whisper in their ear, I still love you. I'm just waiting for you to come in the room. They, they can't eat until you get in the room. I'm not going to waste my oil on people whose hearts are not fully integrated. And watch this. Some of y'all, I hear you. You're saying, but pastor, I've messed up already. I don't think God can use me. The devil is a liar. God wants you just the way you are. All he wants is for you to be honest and say, Lord, I've sinned. I've fallen short. And when you're honest with God, God can take you and clean you up and put some oil on you and use all of that stuff you've been through for your good. Romans 8 and 28 says, for all things work for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. God wants to use you because what you've been through, he can use it for people who will be waiting on you to get in the room. Father, today, God, release them. Release them, Father God, to repent of their sins, to turn back to you, Lord God. That's what you want the most. You want us as a people to come back and turn to you said if my people who which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land Father I thank you that you're healing parts right now you're healing people all over this world wide web right now and God I'm praying for my sister Father God who feels like <clears throat> She made a lot of bad decisions, and, and God, she's so far away from you that you can't use her. The devil is a lie. God, she's closer now than she's ever been before. I pray right now, God, that you bring her back home. I'm praying for that brother, Father God, who's made a lot of bad decisions, and he wants to come back, God. I'm praying right now in the name of Jesus that you would send that brother back home. I don't care that you were locked up. I don't care that you haven't had a relationship with your children. You can still be a good daddy, even though you haven't had one. God says, I'm going to work on your heart. I'm going to turn the father the hearts of the father back to the children and the hearts of the children back to the father God says I'm working on your heart right now all you got to do is say Lord I surrender God take my heart take my mind take my soul God use me God fill me shape me with your Holy Spirit right now in the name of Jesus 
if you prayed that prayer, if, you, if you're if you ready to give your heart to God, if you prayed that prayer, all you got to do right now is just text that number below right there, that number on the screen. Text that number to and, and join today and somebody will reach out to you right now in the name of Jesus. You, you don't have to be a, you don't have to live in Memphis to be a part of this church. Wherever you are, God says, I want you. I love your heart. I see your heart. I'm not looking at what you got on. I'm looking at what you got in. I'm not looking at what you've been through. I'm looking at where you're going. God says, I want you to head in a new direction from the inside out. God wants all of you. Can you surrender today? Can you text that number and say, I want to be baptized. I want to join the church. I want to use my gifts in new direction. I want to help somebody. My heart is for single mothers. My heart is for young people. My heart is for senior citizens. My heart is for justice. My heart is for teaching. My heart is for preaching. My heart is for evangelism. My heart is for missions. My heart is for service. God, I want you to use my heart and God said come on I'm ready for you to head in a new direction from the inside out our mission is to empower all people to know God through life changing experiences God thank you for changing my life from the inside out thank you for not throwing me away thank you for not giving up on me thank you for not turning your back God I need you renew the right spirit restore the joy of my salvation today is the day of salvation come on in this room Come on today. Come on. Don't, don't you let the devil talk you out of joining. Don't you let the devil stop you from your destiny. You're closer now than you've ever been before. Today is the day of salvation. Come on home where you belong. We're not going to judge you. Ain't nobody looking down on you. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all made mistakes before. We're waiting right now to help you up and to pull you in to your destiny. God bless you today. God bless you today. If that's you today. I want you to join today. That's you today. I need you. I need you. No, listen, you. Listen, you. I need you, sis. I need your gifts. Bruh, I need your gifts. Right now, there's so much work to be done in our city, in our nation, in our world. And I can't do it. You got the heart for this. You got the heart for this. You, God's been... God's been speaking to you in your dreams. He's been speaking to you at night. You haven't been able to sleep because God says, I need your heart now. Oh, yeah, God says, you've been, you tried everything else. You tried everybody else. He says, but I need you to try me now. God says, surrender all your heart, your public self, your private self, and yes, your secret self. And you know what? There's nothing so bad that God can't forgive it. There's nothing so bad and ugly that God can't wash it away. He wants you to surrender your heart today. God, I love you. I appreciate you. I pray that the word I speak, I spoke today would not fall on deaf ears. That, Father God, every person that heard this word today, that God, they'd be transformed from the inside out. That you would send them in a new direction. Today, God, we believe it done. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise today? Can we give him praise today? Listen. Thank you. I want to tell you something. I thank God for you and your heart. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And I want you to speak. I deserve God's love. Say that out loud. I deserve God's love. I deserve better. I'm worthy of God's love. And he will never stop loving me. And say this. God, I want you to fully integrate my heart. Consecrate me, Lord, so that I can be a living sacrifice, pure and holy, tried and true. Amen. Thank you for sowing your seeds today. I, we could not do this ministry without you. We are able to reach people and to teach people and to feed people because you keep on giving. And how many of y'all know this? You can't beat God's giving no matter how much you try. Can anybody testify that I'm still eating? I'm still working? Come on. And even if I'm not working, I'm still eating? Ain't God good? God has a way of feeding us even when we don't have a job. God has a way of providing. And I want to I wanna challenge each and every one that's, that's listening to me this morning. I want you to keep sowing your seed and keep giving your tithe. And God says, prove me if I will not open the windows of heaven. Somebody say, there's a window over my head. 
keep proving God. He says, I will open the window of heaven and pour you out a blessing. You won't have room enough to receive. And there's four ways to give. You can text your gift to 901-300-7952. You can go to the website at intonewdirection.org and, and sign up for, for automatic giving. You can use Cash App, dollar sign NDCC Memphis, or you can mail your gift to 6120 Winchester, New Direction Christian Church, Memphis, Tennessee, 38115. I love you. I'm excited for you. I'm going to say this one more time until you get in your spirit. They can't eat until you get in the room. Somebody is waiting on you, and I speak a 72-hour blessing that you will get an email, a phone call, a text message, because somebody's looking for you, and they can't eat until you get in the room. God bless you. I'll see you on Tuesday. We're going to work out on Tuesday at 6.30 p.m., Make sure you're out there on the parking lot, 6120 Winchester. We got to get in shape. But I also want you to get your heart and your mind in shape. God bless you. I'll see you soon.